Good morning, church family. Are you guys ready to worship the Lord this morning? The presence of God is in this place. Hallelujah. David said, David said in Psalms, come worship the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Amen. There is a dynamic that you get together as a church family when you worship the Lord that you just can't get by yourself. And so we're going to worship the Lord today and, 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 and enjoy the presence of the Lord. Let's do this. Hit it. Holy Spirit, feel this place.
You're the reason I'm alive today. And I'll thank you for that every day. Whatever you're facing, just know he'll be a firm foundation. Stronger, nothing. 
the bridge again. the final word, Lord. And that word for, for you today probably is life. That word for you is healing. Or is restoration. Or is a new chapter, a new beginning. Or being fresh again. And we're here today because we love you, Lord, and we honor and we exalt you. And we know who you are. We know what you have done on earth, what you're doing right now, God, and your kingdom is here, Lord, today. And the word of God says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And says, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The Lord is near. He's not only near because He's coming, but He's near today, this place for your life. And don't be anxious. Don't be desperate. The future belongs to God. Your future belongs to God. Your life belongs to God. Your dreams, they belong to God. Your marriage belongs to God. Your children, they belong to God. Your finances, they belong to God. Everything was created through Him, by Him, for Him. And God is under control. He has everything. Our nation belongs to God. Israel belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. Why we're going to be anxious if He is the one controlling everything? And the Lord is near. And he's telling you today, I am with you. I am your father. I am your provider. I love you. I desire you. I'm working in you. I'm working through you. You're not alone in this. I'm in the middle of the situation. I am near. Come on, just lift your hands and receive today the peace. And start just thanking him. That's what the verse says when we come we present ourselves with prayer and petition and with thanksgiving. When you give thanks to the Lord, you know you're going to forget what's happening right now. You're going to forget that you're struggling, that you're going to forget that probably you're sick. You just thank God because He's good, because He's faithful. Because in this time that you're living in right now, He's making you stronger. He's building you up. He's not finished with you. He's just starting. Probably it's painful, but the God, God is near. God is near. And God, I pray right now 
for your people, for your children, being the bring the peace. You are the way maker. You're opening a way right now in this place in our hearts. Can you just lift your hands and just say, God, I receive your peace. I receive your peace, that peace that transcends all understanding, God. I don't understand what's happening, God, but I'm going to trust in you. Your name is above all names. You are the God Almighty. You are powerful, Lord. You are my healer. You are the comforter, Lord. You are the God, the God Almighty, God. And you have the last saying. You have the final word. You have the last word. And the last word for you probably is forgiveness. Today you're forgiven. Today you receive life. Today you receive hope. Today you're encouraged. Today the breath of God is coming to this place to give you life, to prosper you, to lift you up. God loves you and He's telling you, you're not by yourself. I have not forsaken you. I have heard your call. I have heard your shouts. I have heard your cry. I am your God and I am near. I am near. I close to you and I whisper right now and I say, receive my peace. Receive my joy. Receive my healing. I have the last word, not the doctors. I have the last word, not the bank. I have the last word, not the government. I have the last word, not the Senate. I have the last word, not the House. I have the last word, not the President. God has the last word for us. He has the last word for our situation. And God is today in this place, God, and I just give you thanks, Lord, because we can come to your presence. If there's something right now happening in your life, you know, just lay it to God. And just say, God, I surrender. Probably you have to stop fighting and let him fight for you. Be still. Wait, because he is the Lord, our God Almighty. God, we worship you. We worship you. And we're going to wait. And we will see that you are the Lord. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Can you glorify his name? Can you lift his name up? Can you just say, Jesus? Come on, just say, Jesus, my Lord, my Savior. Here you are, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, let's continue worshiping him in this morning.
God, that even when we don't see that you're working, we know that you are working on our behalf. You work all things together for our good. We thank you, God, that you're working in our finances, in our relationships, in our workplaces, in our community. today we can stand in confidence because you are our healer. You are a promise keeping God. Your word never fails. Lord, what you have spoken to us will come to pass and it will come to pass because it is who you are. And you showed us who you were in the fact that you died and that you rose again. And because of that, we can stand in confidence this morning that what you say will come to pass. How many say amen to that? Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Welcome to Grace. We are so glad that you are here today. Turn to the person next to you and say, I am thankful for Jesus. Welcome to Grace. I'm Pastor uh, Brian, and this is my lovely wife, uh, Pastor Melissa. It is our honor to be with you this morning. It's our honor to have you with us uh, this morning. We have a couple of announcements before we get into the meat of uh, the meat of the word today. And Melissa- well, if it's your first time here, or if it's your first time in a long time, we invite you today as our pastor's lunch. We get to know. Pastor and I, but also some of the team that works here at Grace, um, right after service for about 20 minutes, we have a lunch just through these doors and you are welcome to join us and it's all free and we'll give you a lunch and um, help you get connected here at Grace. Yep. You didn't know you were going to get free food when you came to church today, but hey, hey, who doesn't like free food? If you don't like free food, you can quietly leave, but I know that no one will. And so a couple other things. This Thursday night is our our prayer meeting. I want to encourage you, join us on Thursday night as we would join in prayer for what what God is doing, wants to do in our community, but also what is happening happening worldwide. And and that there's there's an urgency for us to be to be in prayer right now. I would say amen to that. So Thursday night, Thursday night, seven o'clock right in here every week. And then finally, next Sunday is our community groups. We do this once a month and we open up houses across across uh, San Diego and 
and we invite you into our homes. It's a great way to connect with other people. To how many know that the journey of faith is not walked alone, it's walked in community together. And, and uh, community groups are a great way for you to help walk out and live out your faith. So if you're sitting in church today and say, oh, I just never get to meet anyone at church. No one ever talks to me. Oh, and you just, just weep, you hear violins playing. Uh, in the background, the symphony. Well, don't worry. Next week, you're invited into somebody's home, all right? And so there's no excuse. And, and, and great news, there's free food there too. So there you go. And so, uh, Ladies, we are. I just want to mark your calendars. Coming up, Mother's Day weekend is our annual ladies' lunch. And this is a, like such a fun night, to, a fun day to be with your not only your mom, your sister, your grandma, your friend, um, and invite them to come. It's a really special, um, so actually, Saturday uh, luncheon. So make sure you get your tickets. Last year, I think we sold out. So make sure you get one. Um, we'd love to have you be a part of that. Also, this week, Tuesday, I don't know if anybody here knows, but we, we feed 200 children in San Marcos that have identif been identified as um, need or in, uh, food insecure. So if you would like to help us, we, we pack food bags for them every week. It goes out. So this coming Tuesday, back here in the offices from 9 to 12, you can drop in at any time and help us pack some food. We'd love to have you. Yes. And let's, we have one more special announcement. You know what? God has made this place a place of influence in our city. And um, only a few years ago, um, Dr. Jody, her daughter was Miss San Diego here. And then um, last night, one of our very own, Addison Schuster, if you don't mind standing up, Addison. She has now become Junior Miss San Diego. Come on up here. Escondido. We have a, her family, if you want to stand too, we have a little special gift for you and a card. There's one thing that I feel like the Lord has allowed us to be a place of influence in our city and that this is a place in a marketplace that she is now going to be representing not only the Lord everywhere she goes and herself, but also our church and the light of the Lord of Jesus. And so I really want to just pray God's blessing over her as she would be the influence this next year. As She is now, Miss, is it Junior Miss Escondido? So we congratulate you. We celebrate you. And we're so proud of you. So if you wouldn't mind extending your hand to her. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus for a place of increase and of influence over Addison this year. And that, Lord, you would allow the light and the love of Jesus Christ to go with her in every venue and place that she would be representing you and advancing your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I heard that Addison brought a little baby Jesus with her on the stage yesterday. So she was not alone, but the <laughs> Lord was with her. Thank you, Addison. Well, that, is that is exciting. And uh, ushers, if you come forward, we're going to continue to worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings uh, this morning. And as we do, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you that everything that you place in our hands, Lord, you give us uh, stewardship to honor and serve you with. And so, Lord, today we come and we bring our tithes to you. Uh, and, Lord, we come and we bring our offerings, knowing that, Lord, what we place in your hand multiplies. And, Lord, what we place in your hand allows the gospel to go from here to around the world. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you give us that, that opportunity to partner with you in serving you with everything that you place in our hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we give this morning, uh, ushers will walk the buckets through the room. Also, you can give online at gracesandmarcos.net on our app. Uh, if you look in the app store at Grace San Marcos, that's a great opportunity. You can also get our notes for the sermon today. And uh, it is a great day to be in the house of the Lord, an opportunity to, uh, to serve him. This week we were, uh, we were at our Grace International Conference and we had an opportunity to meet, uh, to talk with and see missionaries from around the world that we support every month. You may not know this, but when you give to Grace, we support, we support over 20 missionaries uh, around the world, missionaries in, uh, in China, missionaries in Israel, missionaries in Africa and the Middle East, all around the world, your donations help the gospel go around the world. Now, I mean, you know the Great Commission is to allow the gospel to go to the ends of the earth. And I know that it's not always reasonable to have you personally go to the ends of the earth every week, right? That's a little hard. I, I, I don't have enough frequent flyer miles to do that. However, through our giving and through our through supporting missionaries around the world, we are allowing and helping the gospel go to the ends of the, wor ends of the world. How many think that's incredible? That happens because like half of us do. I was hoping everyone, but maybe, maybe a couple more people can applaud next time we talk about that. All right. Um, and so that's a, it's a great opportunity and a great reminder of, of what God wants to do. And so 
and what he is doing through our church and through you. And so today as we come to the word of God, I want to, I want to first talk about what is happening around the world. It's not an accident that even as we had talked to missionaries and, and, and even just talking about the gospel going to the ends of the world, if you're paying attention in the news yesterday, uh, there's, there's enormous, enormous crisis in Israel right now. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about why that's happening. Uh, and I want to talk about why the church is to stand with Israel from a biblical standpoint and from a political standpoint. Now, I know that you uh, we just got applause uh, for that. That's wonderful. You may be here and say, I don't know why I don't know why the church is supposed to stand with Israel. You may you may be here and say, I look at the news and I kind of disagree with what's going on. Well, I want to talk about uh, both of those things. And and the reason is is this, is that as believers, we build our life on the foundation of Jesus Christ. That is, that he is the rock. A wise man builds his house on the on, on, on the rock. And so if, if that is what we build our life on, and then how we live, how we live our life is through the lens and through the, through the teachings of Jesus. So whenever there's an issue in, in our culture, whether it's how we, how we treat people, uh, last week we talked about uh, why we hold to a pro-life value. Uh, this week we're talking about Israel. All of that is filtered through the word of God. When we come to, and this is this is 2024, so we have an election coming up, and I know that there's people who, whenever I bring up cultural or, or uh, what would be seen as political issues, we don't like it. Makes everyone uncomfortable. You know, polite people don't talk about religion or politics. Um, but I'm not polite, so you know that that solves that problem right there. However, I want to challenge that notion. I want to challenge that notion. A couple uh, about six months ago, I, I read a study out of Barna. Uh, Barna is probably the leading, the leading researcher on, on Christianity and in how uh, Christianity is viewed in the, in the public square. And at a rate larger than ever, the younger generation, the Zoomers, the Gen Z, are, are stepping away from church. And the reason, the reason according to Barna in this, in this survey, is that, that the younger generation sees church and sees religion as, as not applicable to their daily life. There's no re they don't see how Christianity affects day-to-day -day issues. And I would want to submit that having pastors and having churches not talk about these issues in order to be seen as non-controversial is doing more harm to the gospel because there's now a generation that has been raised up that doesn't see the application of biblical values in their day-to-day -day life. So the reason that we would talk about uh, Israel and uh, talk about a pro-life value and talk about the elections and all, all of that is because, not because there's, there's a certain party, a certain candidate that I'm advocating for, um, it's because what I'm advocating for is the people of God to live out biblical values in their day-to-day -day life. Deuteronomy chapter six says this, it says, when you teach your children, it, you, 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 the Lord God is one, and you are to teach these things to your children, how do you do that? How do you teach you these, when you get up, when you, when you go out, when you, when you sit down to eat, when you're walking around, inside the house, outside the house, everything that you do is instructing the next generation in how to live out the word of God and to live out biblical values. It is our responsibility, not just to believe, but to be able to articulate what the Bible says about everyday life. And the Bible has a lot to say on everyday life. Has, it has a lot to say on how we treat others. We, we, we know that one. Has a lot to say on how we treat our money. We don't like that one as much. Has a lot to say on how often we're to forgive. We really don't like that one. But it has things to say on how we treat Israel, how we treat these bigger, these bigger pictures. So that is why we're talking about this. Because there, there has to be a generation of the church that grows up comfortable. And when I say generation, I'm not just talking about an age. We are, a, we are a generation of the church right here. There has to be a generation of the church that, that wakes up to the responsibility that God has given you influence and he's given you his word. And 
how, as Romans says, how can the people hear if there's not a preacher? I'm not the only preacher in this room. There's about, there's about 120 preachers in this room, whether you realize it or not. You are a preacher because you have been given the word of God. And so it's our responsibility to be able to articulate those things. All right. So when we look at what's happening in, in Israel right now, I want to talk about it from a religious, uh, from, a, from a spiritual uh, con uh, context, and then also address some of the political realities, because th those aren't divorced. Uh, the reality is, is that when we look at conflict, and when, when we really, when we look at any conflict, there's a, there's a quote that I, that, that, that I like from, uh, I, forget, I forget who it is. It wasn't me, so you just know that someone's smarter than me. But it says, all human conflict, all human conflict at the root is theological. All human conflict at the root is theological. Let's take that, let's take that away from just the Israel issue, but let's look at any controversial, controversial issue. How we, how we view the issue of marriage, theological issue. How we view the value, uh, the issue of abortion and a pro-life value, that's theological. How we view discrimination and racism, that's a theological issue. Why? Because we view people as they're created in the image of God. How we view how we care for the homeless, how we view immigration, how we view Israel, all of that at its core. How we, how we think about pronouns and how we think about the transgender issue, all of that becomes a theological issue at its root. That's why it is so harmful to take the, theolo the theological discussion out of the public square in, in the name of politeness. Because we never deal with the root issue if we take God out of it. And when we, t when we talk about a theological issue, I'm not just talking about a Judeo-Christian worldview. How many know that there's multiple, there's, there's a radical Islam worldview? That's, uh, we're going to talk about that. There's the radical secularism worldview. Each of them have their own cultic worship. Uh, each of them have their own values. And so the, the issue between a Judeo-Christian or a biblical worldview and a radical secular worldview, that is a theological issue, even if you're talking about it with an atheist or you're talking about someone who doesn't believe in Jesus. It's a theological issue at its root. So that's why we, as the church, are to be people that can articulate this. I'm probably talking too long. I got two sermons to preach today, and we only got 40 minutes left, all right? And so here we go. So what, what happened yesterday, and why, why is it significant? As you know, the last six months, there has been a war in Israel. Uh, there was, it started with, with Hamas, uh, Hamas launching these terror attacks against the nation of Israel. We were there. The, those of us there were. We had a, a, a trip in Israel. We were going home the day the, the, the war the war started. That was about six months ago. What happened yesterday was an escalation in, in the conflict because Iran directly attacked Israel. To this to this moment, if you can think about the conflict in Israel, you have Hamas and you have Hezbollah and you have the Houthis and you have Yemen and you have all these all these different people and they all kind of they're dabbling in, you know, Hamas mo most specifically attacking Israel. All of that, if you can think of it like an octopus with tentacles, the root of all of that is in is in Iran. And Iran has been been happy in, the, in this radical this this radical mindset that they would have. In fact, you would say, you know, why why do they have that? I just want to pull out a quote from the leader, the current leader in Iran. The current leader in Iran says this. Iran's supreme leader stated in 2000 regarding Israel that the cancerous tumor called Israel must be uprooted from the region, and that the perpetual sub, uh, uh, subject of Iran uh, and the goal of it is the elimination of Israel from the region. That is their goal. That is their goal. And so when you look at the, the issue, that is, that is Iran, the, 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 the supreme leader in Iran, that is, that is his stated goal. This would be the equivalent if, if, if Biden said that or you know, pick, your, pick whatever world leader you want. That, that is his stated goal. So you have these different tentacles attacking Israel, but now Iran has directly attacked Israel. That is an enormous escalation. Right now, it, it, the, the reality is that as a church, we need to come, as the church of Jesus Christ, we need to come and pray. And, and so that, that, that's what's happening. Why, why did this happen? Well, what you'll hear is, is that Israel killed a couple of the Iranian generals, and this is a retaliation in re response to that. And it's really not a fair comparison. 
because if you remember, even just four or five years ago, Trump, uh, under the Trump administration, there was a general in, in Iran that they had, they killed with a missile, Suleimani, Suleimani, if you remember that. And in response to that, Iran did not send 300 cruise missiles to the United States. I don't know if anyone noticed. This is a similar step that, uh, that Israel took. And the reason was, the same reason the U.S. took that same action, is that that general was considered a terrorist leader. The, the people that were killed uh, by, uh, by Israel, the, those, were pe those were generals that were coordinating Hezbollah and Hamas's response and, and, and attacks towards Israel. So this is, why this is why they took that step. In reality, that may be what that, that may be the, the most recent the most recent thing is, but in reality, there has been a capitulation by our administration, uh, the Biden administration, towards Iran in recent days. They they uh, Biden has has really pushed on Netanyahu to stop the to stop the the, the war in, in in Gaza. They've withholding aid. I don't know if you're you're up on all of that. All of that is within the last few weeks. In fact, Israel pulled out their troops out of, out of Gaza this week and asked for, uh, said a ceasefire, asked for an exchange of hostages, and Hamas said, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. We're not going to meet your demands. So even as of this week, Israel had lowered their guns and said, hey, we're coming to the table. We would like our hostages back. We haven't had them for six months. That's, there's still 100 and, uh, 120, somewhere in that range, of hostages being held, held in Gaza. And Hamas said, no, we, we are not going to do that. And instead, we have 300 missiles launched from Iran directly at Israel. That's, that's the reality of what's, what's going on. And, and Biden's signaling of weakness and signaling to Israel's enemies of like, maybe the U.S. isn't going to support, to support Israel in the same way. And please, let, uh, let it be known that it's, this isn't just a Democrat versus a Republican issue. There's voices on the Republican side, even, even as of the last couple of weeks, that are, that are dishonestly anti-Israel. And so this is, this is an issue on both sides of the aisle. I would say on the extremes of both sides of the aisle. The majority of Americans, about two-thirds according to recent polling, support Israel and want the U.S. to support Israel. However, on the fringes of both parties, there's voices that are rising up saying that this is wrong. And why, why are they saying it's wrong? Well, I want to talk about three reasons that you've probably heard of why Israel's war in, in Gaza and Hamas is, is wrong. And you, you've, you've, heard, you've heard these. One, one is that Israel is killing, killing civilians. The reality of, of, of the, uh, the war in Gaza is that Hamas is not an army. Hamas is a terrorist organization. And so they enmesh themselves with civilians and then any assault is put, it's, it's hiding behind your own women and children to protect yourself. There, it, it's, it's wrong, it's evil. It's more than wrong, it's evil. Can you imagine putting your own child at risk to, to do that? I, I, I can't. So this isn't an army fighting an army. This is, this is a terrorist group fight. Uh, this is a, a terrorist organization. And the Israeli army works towards, works towards protecting civilians. And the reality and tragedy of war is that even with all precautions taken, th that is, there's still collateral damage. And that is a tragedy. And that is not the fault of the IDF. That is the fault of Hamas for one, initiating this conflict, and then two, hiding behind their own civilians. Second thing you've probably heard is, is that this uh, that Israel is an apartheid state, apartheid state. They're 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 cruel to they're cruel to uh, Gaza and the West Bank. And the reality the reality is that Gaza and the West Bank have been under their own control for the last 16 years. Yes, you heard that correctly. 16 years. The government that they elected was Hamas. They they voted in a terrorist organization. I'm not gonna, I'm going to say that it probably wasn't the wisest decision, but the other reality that when we look at the the how Israel treats treats Gaza, they call it an apartheid state because they have borders around it. Well, you have to ask the same question: Why does Egypt and why does Jordan have the same borders on the West Bank and on Gaza? It's because that the reality of of Hamas is that that's a toxic, evil leadership, and Egypt doesn't want them in their nation. 
Jordan doesn't want him in their nation. Israel doesn't want him in their nation. And this is why the war is taking place. We have to remember what started this. What started this was October 7th, when there was 1,200 people, terrorists murdered, 1,200 people took hundreds hostage. And so, so is it an apartheid state? No, That's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous assertion. Third thing that you've probably heard is that Israel is ethnically cleansing their, their nation. How many have ever heard something like that? And here's the, here's, here's the reality. In Israel, the population breakdown of Israel is it's over 20% Arab and Christian within the nation of Israel. They are not ethnically cleansing anyone. They are opposing evil in their own, in their own backyard, along with other bordering nations. And so if you are a Christian, if you are an Arab in Israel, you can sit on the Supreme Court, you can run for office, you can hold office. You can, there are Arabs that are on the Supreme Court in Israel. Now, let me ask a question. If there's ethnic cleansing, what's the percentage of Christians and Jews living in states run by radical Islam? I'm going to just, spoiler alert, it's not 20%. It's not 20%. And there's this place where there's these lies that are said, and those lies are parroted to our own administration to say, well, if, if, if you don't stop this, this is all of the evil going on. This is, there's tragedy that's going on. There's not evil that's happening. And the reality is, is that our own administration is hearing those lies and Biden is concerned about his election in November. Once he started getting down in the polls about a month ago, he started to shift position on that because there's certain states that he needs to win, like Michigan, that have a higher percentage of, uh, uh, of is, uh, Islamic uh, voters. That is why he has shifted his policy. As, so he is willing to compromise an ally for his own, potentially his own, his own election. That is, that is another aspect of this. So where are we at in, in, in the war right now? We have to re remember this. All human, all human conflict at its root is theological. It's at its root is theological. And the reality of, uh, of Iran right now is that, and radical Islam, is it wants to wipe off the map Israel. I read you earlier what the, the leader of uh, Iran says, that Israel is a cancerous tumor that must be removed. We have to also remember that it's not, there's, there's, when you, when you are dealing with, with the Islamic mindset, there's the radical Islam that, that is, that is Iran. Yet, un, when, when Trump was president, you may have remembered there was the Abraham, uh, the Abraham Accords. Those were moderate Islamic nations willing to have peace with Israel. At the time, it was Bahrain and the UAE. Saudi Arabia was close. Why? Because they were afraid of the radicalization of Iran and how it destabilizes the region. And they would rather align themselves with Israel so that there is peace in, in that region. So when we are standing with Israel, it's not that you're standing against Arabs. It's not that you're standing against Arab nations. You're standing with people that are wanting peace. You're standing with people that are wanting peace. And the tragedy of what is happening right now is that Iran is more than willing to sow discord and to sow violence and to sow terror into the region through Hezbollah, through, through Hamas, and now through their own direct attack at Israel. So how, how do we pray? The, reali the reality is we have to remember that the conflict was, this, this whole conflict was initiated by Iran. Even the uh, original Hamas attack, funded, 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 funded through Iran. To remember that all human conflict is theological at its base. If you remember when, when uh, on October 7th, what Hamas called the operation of that first terror, terrorist attack, it was Operation Al-Aqsa Flood. Operation, what is, what is Al-Aqsa? Al-Aqsa is the mosque on the Temple Mount that sits where the, temp, the, the Jewish temple will one day be rebuilt. And the, the, the goal of, of this attack was to push the Jews out of the area because they are defiling the land, as this uh, Iranian leader said, and they want to reclaim Al-Aqsa. So this is, all human conflict is theological at, 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 its, at its base. Um, we have to remember that all of these, all of these, it's, it's an octopus. The tentacles of Hamas, Hezbollah, all, all of it with, with, the, core, with the core in Iran. And... 
with that, with that, we what is our response as believers to be? What is our response as believers? And why, why does the Bible call us to stand with Israel? One, our response is that we need to be praying for peace. And we need to be praying for wisdom for the, the leadership in Israel, the leadership in the United States, the leadership in the EU. There is, there is a possibility, you know, everyone talks about World War III. Um, it, is not, it is not a conspiracy theory to say how this is responded to in the next short amount of time has, has global implications. So the church has one of two choices. One, we can be afraid and put our head in the sand and pretend like it doesn't exist. Or we can pray and we can lift our voice and we can say, Lord, I am prioritizing what you are prioritizing. I'm pri and, and the word of God calls us to, in Psalms 122, verse 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It doesn't just say Jews pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It says that the reader of this psalm, so if you, if you hold to the Holy Scriptures, and I'm sure that we all do in this room, we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so that is part of, part of our, our responsibility. So why should, why should we stand with Israel? I'm going to give you three reasons, and then we're going to go on to the second sermon of the day. We're going to pray, and then we'll go on to the second sermon of the day. Number one, the people and the land of Israel are a treasure to God. The people and the land of Israel are a treasure to to God. Zechariah chapter 2 verse 8 says this, For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which you plunder, for he who touches you, Israel, touches the apple of his eye. The, the Lord says that the apple of his eye are the people in the land of Israel, and he who touches them touches the apple of his eye. I don't know what the apple of your eye is, but how many know? I know that there's some mama bears in the room, right? You touch your kids and you're just gonna be, there's going to be a problem. And that's what the Lord's saying in this verse. Number two, uh, second the verse, when it says that the people in the land of Israel are treasure to the Lord. Genesis chapter 12, uh, 3, the Lord says, In the covenant he makes to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That God in his unique, his unique uh, wisdom, chose the nation and the land of Israel to be the place and the people that he was to unveil his salvation for all of humanity. Because of that, that's the second thing. That's so one, we know that the, the people of Israel are a treasure to God. Number two, as believers, we are linked with the Jewish people like a root and a branch are linked. And Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 11, that the, the root of our faith, the root of our faith, is, is the, Jew, the Jewish people, the, the land, the people, and how God had used them. And in the same way that we cannot be cut off, as, and we as Gentiles, and I would say most of us are Gentiles in the room, um, we have been grafted into that root to receive salvation, and we do that through faith in Jesus Christ. And in the same way that a branch cannot be divorced from the root, and it has no life. So we are linked in that way. So one, the land and the people of Israel are a treasure to the Lord. Number two, it's through that unique dispensation and through that unique adoption of that land and that people that salvation came to all of humanity. And we in our faith are, are, are linked, are linked in that way. And Paul talks about that. You can read about it in Romans 11. Romans 11, 16 says this, If the first fruit is holy, so the lump is holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And he goes on and talks about it. There's a whole sermon in there, and we don't have time for that today. The third reason that we are to pray, uh, that we are to stand with Israel is God calls us to pray for Jerusalem. God calls us to pray for two cities. He calls us to pray for the city that he has placed you in. That's Jeremiah chapter 29. And he calls you to pray for Jerusalem. Psalms 122. He calls us to pray for both of those things. And with that, that, that response, it's not just some people, it's all. So if we are loving the things, if, if our worldview is built on Jesus Christ, and we see the world through the lens of our faith, then we are going to love what God loves, and Israel, the people and the land, are the apple of his eye. Uh, Zechariah chapter 2. If we are going to do, if we're going to love what Jesus loves, we're going to love the nation and the people of Israel. Number two, we owe a, a, a tremendous 
uh, 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 debt to them that, that the Lord, the Lord has, has shown, uh, has revealed Jesus and the plan of salvation through the Jewish people. And, that is, and because of that, we are linked with them like a root and a branch together. And number three, we are called to pray. We are called to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And even when we say the peace, Jerusalem is the only city that God has placed his name. And when the Jerusalem means the city of peace, the city of peace. And it, wouldn't it be like the adversary to be looking to sow violence on the city where God has placed his name and that name is peace. In fact, in Hebrew, what Hamas means in Hebrew is violence. That literally the, the battle between Israel and, and, and Hamas is a battle between peace and violence. And the Lord calls us as people who our Savior is the Prince of Peace, who will one day return in glory and stand in the city of peace. That in the meantime, we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we would say amen to that. I'm going to invite you to stand and then we're, and, and let's pray together. As we stand, if we join in, in unity together, join hands all, all, all throughout this room. Lord, Lord, it's, it's with a heavy heart, Lord, that we come this morning recognizing, recognizing the, the consequences of what is happening around us. Recognizing that what's happening a world away affects us in our own day to day, right now. Lord, I would pray Lord, as you command us, Lord, for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, I pray for an end to this war. I pray for Hamas to surrender and to give up their hostages and for Iran to stand down. Lord, I pray that this would not escalate beyond where it is right now, but Lord, that you would give uh, victory, victory over, over terrorism, terrorism that would seek to, to destabilize an entire region. Lord, your word says in Proverbs that righteousness exalts a nation, but wickedness is a shame and a reproach and a burden upon the people. Lord, we see that, that burden upon, uh, upon uh, the Palestinians and the burden that evil leadership is weighing upon them. And so, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would put God-fearing leaders, Lord, in Israel, in every branch of the government. Lord, we pray that you put God-fearing leaders in Gaza and, and in and the West Bank and Iran. And Lord, that you would bring people that would desire peace. You would bring people that would desire peace. Lord, I pray wisdom, Lord, for our president, wisdom for the leadership in, in, in Israel, for Netanyahu and the, and, and the cabinet there. And Lord, that you would direct their steps. Lord, we know that your word says that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path that you reveal the path for us as we follow your word. And so, so today I pray that there would be a revealing of the right steps forward, Lord, and Lord, that there would be peace in your land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, tell someone next to you, I'm going to be praying for Israel this week. And please have a seat. I pray that, that that summary was helpful, and, and I hope that it, it spurs you to be praying this week. On Thursday night, we will be praying about this very issue uh, again. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn to Nehemiah chapter 2. We are going to continue in our series in Nehemiah chapter 2 about be, building the life that God calls us to build. And the title of the message today is Building a Life That Works, Building a life that works. I don't know about you, but I've built several things in my life, most of them unsuccessfully, all right? Uh, my wife is laughing too loud uh, because she knows it is too true, all right? The Lord has given me certain talents. Building is not, uh, building, building things and uh, home repairs is not one of them. And the reality is that when you start building something, you want to build something that works, all right? You don't want to build something that doesn't work. What a waste of time and resources. And so when we talk about building our life with God, we want to build a life that works. And I, today I want to give you three principles on building a life that works. Or maybe another way to say it is building a life that functions, 
that our life and, and our, our walk with the Lord is to bring health, is to bring safety, is to bring wholeness into our life. The story of Nehemiah, Nehemiah uh, being a, repre a representation of the Holy Spirit, is that the, Nehemiah comes to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, and his task is to rebuild the walls. And those walls serve uh, several functions. We're going to talk about some of those functions today. Because in the same way that God calls us to build, he wants us to build something that's functional, something that works, something that brings health and security and safety and, and health to, to our lives. And so often we look at our lives and we say, uh, you know, hey, there's, there's, there's a mess, but I, I'm just not totally sure. Like, what I, I, I know I need to clean it up, but... Like, how do you clean it up? It's like, like a really hairy guy. You know, like, you, you know those people, you may be here, in the, you may be a guy in this room, and you're like that, where like the hair on your back and, and, and the hair on your head and the hair on your chin and the hair on your chest, they all meet. It's just like homogenous. You're just like a walking Chewbacca. We all know people like this, all right? And so it's like, when you shave in the morning, it's like, where do you stop? All right, like, where, where, I'm, getting my, I'm getting a haircut. Where, where do I start? Where do I stop? And you don't really know the answer, all right? Do you just, just burn it all away, just, just wax head to toe? Uh, that, that's, that's uncomfortable. Uh, there must be a better solution. There's functional ways that the Lord has us to build his life, and I want to talk, uh, our lives. I want to talk about three of them, and it's found in the story of Nehemiah. And in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 13 to 15, uh, the, I, don't know if the, I don't know if they're going to be on the screen, but they're on our app. It says this. It says, Nehemiah is, is surveying, surveying the city. And it says, I went out. By night, through the valley gate, to the serpent well, to the refuse gate, viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and its gates were burned with fire. Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, and there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So I went up by night to the valley, and I viewed the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate, and so returned. Here in this passage, right there, Nehemiah is giving the layout of the city and, and talking about the different functions that the city happens. Some of the places were unusable. He couldn't even, could you imagine a gate in ancient times that you couldn't take your donkey through? Well, that's not a very functional gate then, is it? You know, there's not a lot of commerce. There's not a lot of action happening all the way through there. And I want to highlight three of the places here, three of the places uh, that I believe are aspects of our life that the Lord needs to develop so that there's a function and a health that comes to our, to our lives. We understand this from, from uh, our, our physical bodies. We understand this for how our home operates. And in that same way, as we look at this, we see that, that the first, there's, there's three places that I want to talk about. One, there's the, fount, the fountain gate. What was the purpose of the fountain gate? Well, it was through that gate that they would go and receive water. All right, that's number two. Number two, the second, the second gate that we want to talk about is the refuse gate. If you have a, a King James Version, we call it the dung gate. All right? What went through that gate? Exactly what you think went through that gate. All right? All of the garbage and all of the... It was the sewer of the city. All right? And then the third is the king's fountain, the, uh, uh, the, the king's pool. And the king's pool... Uh, was a place within the city. And even if you go to Jerusalem today and you view the ancient ruins, there were different places all throughout the city where there were different pools where water would come. And in the, the water being collected there, it provided uh, refreshment. It provided cleans, cleanliness to, to the city. These are three aspects of our life that the Lord calls us to develop if we are going to build a life that functions. And we understand this. Think about your own home. And, and the, the reality of the, the refuse gate or the garbage gate. How many of you have ever, how many have ever missed garbage day? All right. You, the cans are supposed to go out and you've missed garbage day. And it is a hassle, right? It's a smelly hassle and no one likes it. I mean, we have missed, we have missed a garbage day more times than I care to remember. But I always blame my kids, so it's okay. And... <laughs> Because that's their job now, uh, to, to wheel, wheel the garbage cans out. And if you miss garbage day, you need to find a place for that trash to go. And next thing you know, you're putting bags of garbage in the back of your car. And it's like, this is terrible, all right? Especially if it's summertime, right? I, it's, it's, just, it's, it's terrible. 
we understand that there has to be a regular flow where things are eliminated from our life so there can be cleanliness within the home. Our spiritual lives are the same thing. What is the process that God takes us to help us deal with the garbage of our lives? The garbage of our lives. And some of you may look at your own life and say, I, I, I'm, there's just, there's just, I just feel like I can never get stuff clean. Well, maybe that garbage gate is a place that needs to be developed within you so that there's, there's a regular processing of things that aren't helpful, things that are making you dirty, if, if, uh, from a physical standpoint, making you sick. You know, your, your body functions to get rid of the garbage within your body. You know, you go to Taco Bell, you know your body is working really hard to get rid of that. So whether, if your kidneys aren't functioning, you're sick. Your liver's not functioning, you're sick. Even, even the breath in your lungs, we breathe in oxygen, we hold it within our lungs, and there comes a point where that oxygen is used up and we are expelling toxins. Even just as you are listening, you are your body is cleansing itself to keep it healthy. And so in our spiritual life, how do we cleanse ourselves so that we have health within our lives? I'm going to give you three, three principles here. And it comes out, of, uh, comes out of 1 John chapter 1 verses 5 to 10. If you have your Bible, I would, I would, turn, uh, I would turn there. 1 John, and really, the issue of dealing with garbage is the issue of dealing with sin in our lives. The issue of dealing with garbage in our lives is the issue of dealing with sin in our lives. And no one likes to talk about sin. It is, it is really the, the, the fundamental deception of the adversary is that we that he gets us to he tempts us with sin. We look at this in the Garden of Eden. He tempts Eve with sin. And then what happens next? She's hiding. She's hiding from God. Sin separates us from God and the lie of the adversary is always to tempt us and then to separate us. To tempt us to get to make a mistake and then to separate us. Oh, I could God could never forgive me. I could never I could never show my face in church. You know, every Christian's going to going to judge me. God's going to judge me. I'm going to be struck by lightning just thinking about God. That's that's a lie of the adversary. It's a lie of the adversary. And I'll tell you I'll, I'll tell you why. Number 1, to deal with sin in our lives it requires three things. Number 1, it means that you need to know it needs to know where you stand. Know where you stand. How does God view you? How does God view you? I'm glad you asked. First John chapter 1 verse verse 7. You are children of the light and his blood purifies you. You are children of the light and his blood purifies you. How does God view you? He views you as righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the reality. Now you may say to yourself, well, I've messed up. I've messed up. I, and we're going to get to that in a second. I've messed up. God could never accept me. No, that's a lie of the adversary. Sin separates us from God and, and the lie of the adversary is he wants to separate you from the people and, and from God and from people around you. So number one, you need to know, you need to know where you stand with God. And where you stand with God is redeemed by the blood of Jesus. How many are thankful for that? Amen. Amen. Number two, we need to know our authority. Not only do we need to know where we stand, but we need to know where our power is. And our power is in Jesus Christ. It says that we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And the reality of the voice of the adversary in our lives is he, uh, the scripture says he is the accuser of the brethren. But the reality is, is that through Jesus Christ, we are victorious. We are victorious even over the plans and the schemes of hell. John says this in John chapter 8, talking about Satan. It says that he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Have you ever wondered what, what the adversary is, is, is chirping in your ear? It doesn't matter what he's saying. You can just know that it's a lie. There is no truth in him, and he cannot, he cannot be honest. He cannot, he cannot tell the truth. He is the father of lies, and there is no truth in him. Even when he is quoting scripture to Jesus in Luke chapter 4, he is distorting and perverting it. 
he is giving a half truth. And how many know if, there, if it's half truth, it's all a lie, all right? And so this is, this is who, this is who, this is who the adversary is. And in 1 John chapter 3, 7 and 8 says, Whoever practices righteousness is righteous. As he is righteous, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the the works of the devil. So know where you stand. Where do you stand? You stand under the blood of Jesus Christ. If you are a believer, you are forgiven. Number two, know your authority. If you're standing under the blood, then you're standing in victory because Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. If that doesn't get an amen, I don't know what will, all right? And then the third thing, when, we, when we're dealing with garbage, the dealing with the garbage of our life, the third thing is this, is that we need to come and we need to confess our sin. Confess our sin. And when we say confess our sin, I'm not saying that you need to go to a dark room and talk to a priest in a creepy little closet or something like that, all right? <laughs> Confessing our sin is saying, God, here is what you say, and I'm going to live that way. Confessing our sin is coming before the mirror of the word of God, and when we see in our reflection something that doesn't line up, making that change. That is what confession is. And we come and we say, Lord, I come before your word, and this is out of place. This is out of place. How many have ever gotten ready in the morning? All right, you look at the mirror, horrified by what you see. You know, make it better, all right? I, I, know, I know Bob definitely has had that uh, it, it happen before. Um, horrified, make it, make it look better. Go do something. Come back into the mirror and recognize that you've missed a whole bunch. All right, anyone that's ever happened to I, I'm just raising my hat on a polite list. That's never, never happened to me. Um, every time you look in the mirror, if you're honest, you could find something that needs adjustment, a hair that's out of place, uh, something in your teeth, a place you missed when you were shaving, ladies. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that was inappropriate. All right. There's always something that needs adjustment. That is what confession is. Bringing our spiritual lives before the living God, bringing our spiritual lives before Jesus, who is the word, and saying, I'm making adjustments as I see them before my eyes. And then scripture also talks about that there's times where we need, just like taking out the garbage, sometimes there's garbage in the house where you need two people to carry it. There are other times that you come and you confess one to another. And it says this in, in James chapter five, you confess one to another and then you pray for each other. That this process of confession should be as natural as you and I are breathing. And if any of us stopped breathing in the last couple of minutes, one, take a breath. But two, the reason that would be harmful is because there's a toxic buildup within you. If we are not regularly coming before the word of the Lord and saying, Lord, just refresh in me the truth of your word, then there's a toxic buildup that happens. All right. So the first thing is, if we're going to be dealing with building a life that is functional. The first thing is we need to know what to do with the garbage and the garbage needs to get out. We don't keep garbage in our house. We have it in bins outside and then every week those bins go away. We have, we have sinks and we have, we have sewers. For We are very thankful for that. One of the greatest inventions of all time. All right, And it's because we don't want to keep any of that in the house. It needs to get out. It needs to get out. And if it doesn't get out, then we're going to get unhealthy. It is that way with our spiritual life. The second thing, the second thing that we need to get built in our lives so that we live as functional people before the Lord is what is talked about as the fountain gate. It's a place where we go out to receive the resources of the word of God. The, the fountain gate would be, was a place where they would go out, they would go to the spring, they would collect water and they would bring it back in. And this was a daily occurrence. This was a daily occurrence. And so so in your own life, how do we live a life that is constantly like we are breathing, bringing that confession before the Lord is that we are constantly putting the word of God before our, before our face. And in that, that daily examination of the scripture, uh, ex a daily examination of, of seeing, seeing the word of God and applying that to our lives, there's a refreshing, there's a strength that comes. Could you imagine if you hadn't, if you didn't have water for an entire day, you'd be, you would not be in good shape. Imagine if you didn't have it for three days, you'd be in real bad shape. 
And there's this place where we get satisfied or we, we become complacent in allowing the refreshing of the word of God to wash over us. I thought of this example. I don't know if you've ever gone camping before. Um, but it's, you know, you, you go, you get a tent. And, and every summer we take our kids up to Donner with my, my sister and their cousins. And, and if you've ever gone camping, you realize that it is filthy. It is a filthy endeavor. There is dust, dirt everywhere everywhere. You just breathe and you're filthy, all right? And the greatest thing camping is you can buy quarter, you can buy tokens, and it will give you a, a five-minute shower. You go, there's, a, there's, a, there's a shower house for five, five minutes. You just put like one dollar and you get a five-minute shower. And after that shower and all of the grime of the day is washed off, you feel like a million bucks. Every, every time. I mean, the greatest, the greatest moment in the day is when you, you take that shower at the end of the day and you wipe off, you wash off all of the dirt off of you. That is what it is coming to the Word of God. Do you know it takes five minutes, uh, five minutes a day to read a chapter of Scripture? Same as that shower. Same as that shower. You know what doesn't make a difference? If I said, you know, I really want to be clean, and so I'm going to take all seven of my tokens, one for each day of the week, I'm going to take a 35-minute shower, and I'm, just, I'm going to be so clean, I won't need to ever go to the shower the other six days of the week. How many know that doesn't work? A 35-minute shower doesn't equal seven five-minute showers. All right? So it is with our devotions. So it is with coming to the Word of God. Every day coming to the Word of God will refresh your soul much more than taking one, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really going to, I'm going to get into the Word, I'm going to read the whole Bible in a day, and then I'm good for the rest of the year. No. No, it just ask your spouse, should I shower once a year? But what if it's a really good one, right? <laughs> what if I get, you know, really scrub everything? No, it doesn't matter because there is something that happens in the regular refreshing of the word of God over our souls. If being in scripture and being before the presence of the God is not part of your daily activity, I want to encourage you, start showering. Worship team, come on up. The last the last, the, last, uh, the, the last thing is, number one, we have to build, uh, in building things in our lives, we need to build systems that function. And in building systems that function, we allow there to be health that comes. So in a city, you have to have a place for the garbage to go. In a city, you have a place for, the, for, for people to come in and out and get water. In our home, we have a place that the garbage goes. In our body, we have a place that the garbage goes. In, in our body, we recognize we need to have daily nutrition. In, in our house, we, we provide that daily nutrition. We have food in the fridge and we're, we're, we cook every day or at least get DoorDash, right? A city has, has places where there's nutrition that's able to come in. Our spiritual lives should be the same way. The, the, the third place is this, is that there's pools that were provided and they were provided so that there could be a place even when the city was under attack, because that fountain gate don't work if there's an army outside. There's a deposit of the Holy Spirit that God wants to give us. And God today would say, not only do I want you to come to, to your, the word every day, but I want to deposit something of my spirit within you that becomes a resource against the enemy, becomes a resource to refresh you, to get a resource to supply you, to be a place of healing and strength. In fact, that the, the, the pool that, that is there in, in the scripture is the pool of Shalom. The pool of Shalom, in, in, we see it in the New Testament in John chapter 9. It's where the blind man came and received his healing. When the Lord puts his spirit inside of you, there's things that begin to set right, be set right. There's healing and restoration that begins to come. And today, as we, as we apply this, this message, we can say, Lord, I want a life that functions. I want a life that functions. I don't want to live with a pile. I, I don't want to be a hoarder. I don't, want to be, I don't want to have a pile of garbage in my front yard. I don't want to have a pile of garbage in my soul. I don't want to be someone that's starving and filthy. I want to be able to receive daily of your word, to be refreshed by the, by the living water, to allow that living water to cleanse me, head to toe. And I don't want to just take a shower once a month or two times a month or once a week, every day, to allow that to be a refreshing. Imagine, imagine what your life looks like when there's that daily refreshing. And not only that daily refreshing, but Lord, to receive a deposit of the Holy Spirit that defines who I am, 
that protects me, that heals me, that brings, that brings revival within my soul. The Lord wants to do that. That's, that's a life that's functional. You know, and you may hear this message today. And this is the last thing. There's a saying that says that, that people overestimate what can be done in a day and underestimate what could be done in a week, in a month, or in a year. Meaning this, as people, we like to take the 35 minute shower, all right? And then we're gonna, we've dealt with that and now we're moving on to the next thing. But the daily discipline has more transformative power than one moment. We understand this when it comes to exercise. I can go exercise, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get myself in shape, I'm gonna work out for four hours. Well, you're way better off taking that four hours and breaking it up into 20 minutes over the course of a month. You will see progress. If you just do work out in four hours, you're probably in the hospital, all right? And so what the Lord's calling us to do is not to go in and just rip everything down and, and tear everything out and do all that. No, he's asking you to commit to a daily habit of being with him. And in that daily habit of being with him, you're taking out the things that don't belong. You're adjusting the things that need to be adjusted. And you're feeding your soul in a way that life and health and strength can come. And we would say amen to that. Lord, we thank you for your word today. And we thank you that your word is living and active and applicable to our daily lives. Lord, I pray for each one of us in this room that you would give us strength and application to put into practice the things that we've just talked about. Lord, that we would come to the place of daily examining your word, daily confessing the places that we fall short, knowing that in, con in that confession, we are yours. We could never be more loved. We can never be more victorious, but we can be moving closer and closer in being transformed into your image. Help us make that transformation. You may be here today and you would say, Pastor, I'd love to, uh, I, I heard the message today and there's places in my life where I need to build my life on the foundation of Jesus Christ and to give yourself over to that commitment. You may have never opened up your, your heart to the love of Jesus Christ. Today is your day. Today is your day. If you are needing to make that decision of opening up your heart to the love of Jesus Christ, would you look up at me? I want to, and you looking up at me, we are agreeing together that today you are making that decision. Is that why I agree with you? Today, the Lord comes to be Lord of your life. Is there, any, is there someone who wants to join this? Today, today, Lord, Lord comes to be Lord of your life today. The Lord comes to be Lord of your life. Is there anyone else who would join these three? Uh, uh, today, uh, yes, both of you. Today, the Lord comes to set things right, to set things new. The Word says that He is the one that makes all things new. Today, today the Lord wants to make those areas new in your life. Is there anyone else who would join these five that you would say, today I need to make, I, if, if I'm missing you, would you just raise your hand? I don't want to miss any person in this room. Lord, I thank you for these five. And Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. Lord, I pray that you would help us make, build a life that functions, that brings health and strength to us and to the people around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we dismiss one more minute, I'm going to invite our prayer team to come forward. If there's an area, if there's an area in your life that you need prayer, we want to pray with you and partner with you. And so as people go to the exits, I'm going to invite you to come down front. We would love to pray with you. Number two, if you were someone that looked at me and you said, I need to open up my heart to the love of Jesus Christ. At the conclusion of service in 20 seconds, I'm going to ask that you would come down front and meet with Dan, Dan and Marlene. <coughs> they want to help you take that next step in your walk with the Lord. It's the most important decision that you'll make today is taking the next five minutes to pray with somebody to help you put feet to the decision that you have just made. Some of you looked at me and you've looked at me before. It's time to come down front and help put feet to the decision that you're making. Third thing, if you are new to the church and you would say, I would love to get connected or I would love to have a free lunch. Right after service, right up those doors where Dan and Marlene are standing is our lunch with the pastors. We wanna help connect you 
with what God is doing. The journey of faith is not walked alone. Don't do that. Come and walk with us. We want to help you become everything God's called you to be. Let's stand together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that for your spirit. And thank you that you call us to move forward. Help us take those steps. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you Thursday night. Yeah.